。您知道你的智慧手机也像电脑一样会遭到骇客入侵吗？特别是网络银行被窃取资料的几率很高。而今天的关键对话，我们就为您专访到拥有全球白帽骇客认证的资安专家，他甚至还是现场示范了，要侵入智慧手机其实非常容易。各位观众朋友，大家好！我们今天非常荣幸邀请到了趋势科技全球安全副总 Rick Ferguson 来接受我们的专访。Hello, nice to meet you, Rick. Hey Ashley. Hey everybody in TV land. And we know that uh, recent recent days that uh, uh, American stock market, Nasdaq stock market, that have a crash event, and uh, more than 3,000 companies, uh, including Apple and Google, they were forced to uh, stop transactions. This one, this event caused the market to concern about the electronic transaction security, and we are curious about that. Is that means the transaction security is not safe enough? I think if you look at the recent events, certainly the the Nasdaq one. Um, at the moment, people are of the uh, impression that it was a, a technical failure, so a failure in the technology behind uh, the Nasdaq, rather than any kind of direct attack on the platform. Any kind of technology um, obviously is prone to some kind of failure at some point. If you look ac across the history of NASDAQ trading, um, these kind of events are thankfully very, very rare. But I think what's possibly more important to look at is an example of also recently when the Twitter account of Associated Press was hacked and a fake tweet was sent out saying that there had been an explosion at the White House, um, that people had been injured. And just as a result of that single tweet, it wiped um, a huge amount off the value of stock markets for a very short period of time. But just by compromising someone's Twitter account, which is uh, a lot more easy and it happens a lot more often than a failure in the technology, you can actually cause big fluctuations in the values of stocks and shares. Um, and that's certainly a way that I think criminals will be investigating in the future to make money from, uh, from direct hacks. Up to 90% of the company were affected by these malwares, but 55% that they, they are aware of this problem. And most of these are online bank, right? When we talk about banking malware, then more often it's attacks on individual consumers, the customers of the bank compromising their PCs and using those compromised computers to initiate uh, fraudulent banking transactions and stealing money both from the individual and of course from the financial institution as well. So the security is not on the bank itself, it's, because it's on our, um, our user device like PC and, uh, and the mobile device, right? So if that person's home PC or mobile device is compromised, then it can result in financial damage for the individual and for the bank. And very often, um, unfortunately, end user PCs, consumer PCs, are not secured um, sufficiently. In fact, Taiwan is globally in the top five countries affected by banking malware. Well, it sounds very dangerous. So can you show us that how hackers that hack into uh, people's mobile device? So this is an Android device. It's running Android 4.1. Um, I haven't exploited any vulnerabilities on the device, I haven't taken advantage of any um, weakness, but what has happened is that let's say the end user has installed an app which he thought was a game, uh, but actually it's a criminal trojanized app for the mobile device. Um, even if you're extremely paranoid and you go and you look at which apps are running on the device, this particular app has been designed so it doesn't show up as a running app, so there's nothing visible on there in terms of uh, bad behavior, so you would think everything is fine. But as I said, actually it's compromised. So if I leave that one there, I can take another phone, any, any other phone, and uh, I can open a, a text message. Just send a simple text message to that device. Um, and the text message says, this is your master. I could send it from any phone. This is your master. It will arrive on this device, on the Android phone, but there's no notification that a text message has arrived. Um, but nevertheless, it sends a reply back to this phone. So there's no notification on here that anything was received, but I've received an SMS reply that says, I'm ready to serve you. And now I know that I have remote control over this Android device. So I can send any number of other commands. I can send a command, for example, SMS spy enable. And then any incoming SMS message on this device will be intercepted and recorded. I could send call spy enable. 
any incoming telephone call now to this device will be recorded and intercepted. So I can listen in on people's telephone calls. Um, I could send another command, uh, for example, to enable the microphone. So now, right now, even though there's, again, no notification that anything has been received, the microphone on this device is now switched on and it's recording our, our conversation. Um, you can imagine how useful that would be if you were trying to spy on a competitor company for industrial espionage, listen into a board meeting, that kind of thing. Um, but of course, all of that stolen information is still actually on this device. You can see I don't have anything here. I've just been sending commands. So the question has to be, how do I get the information now off this device if I want to have access to that? And it's actually very simple uh, because these things, smartphones, are just small PCs at the end of the day. Uh, but the great advantage is they're always switched on and they're always connected uh, by definition. So if I decide I now have enough information, I want to get hold of that now, then I can just send another command to this device. I can send a command that says upload files. And then when that command is received here, again, no notification, no messages received, no indication that anything bad is happening. Um, but this device is now taking that stolen information, zipping it up into a, a compressed file, and uploading it to a, to a web server. And then it sends me back a text message with a URL where I can just go and download all that stolen information. Well, that's really dangerous. It's, it's dangerous and it's, it's very simple. The, the big problem is that um, individuals are not paying enough attention to the permissions that apps are requesting when you install them. As for me, I usually use this mobile device to enter into the online bank. Yeah, yeah so this is really unsafe, right? Now, I understand that in Taiwan, the the, the usual way to uh, secure online banking is that when you make a transaction, you get a code sent by SMS to your mobile device, which you then have to enter into online banking, and the transaction will happen. Maybe they can uh, record what I type. There is uh, malware, mo mobile banking malware, which is designed to intercept those SMSs and transmit the authentication code to the criminal so that they can still carry on making transactions. Um, the major problem is that banks are securing the wrong thing. So at the moment, the majority of banks are authenticating the user. The user is proving that they are who they say they are. And that's the only thing that they're proving. So you type in your name and your password. You demonstrate that, that that's you. Yeah. And then when you get the code on your mobile device, you demonstrate that you have your mobile device as well, which is another way of proving that that's you. That's fine, and it's an important part of the process. Banks should be authenticating the user. But the other thing which banks should be doing, and most of them are not, is authenticating the transaction. So there should be a code which you have to enter, which has some kind of logical relationship with the amount of the transaction as well. Because if you imagine what criminals are doing, the malware on your PC is actually sitting inside your web browser. So it's directly in between you and the bank. Anything you type into your browser, so I tell the browser, transfer 100 pounds to my mum. But the criminal in the browser can modify that and say, no, actually, transfer 1,000 pounds to my friend and begin to steal your money. Now, if you're not authenticating and verifying the details of the transaction, it doesn't matter if you're doing it in a secure tunnel where the user is authenticated or not because the criminal can still modify all of those transactions. And how can we avoid this crisis? So when your PC notifies you that there's an upgrade available or an update, a security patch, install it. Click OK. Don't just drag the window off to the side so you can ignore it or postpone or cancel. You're talking about me. I'm talking about a lot of people, not just you. <laughs> um, something that you can do on mobile devices uh, is make sure that you stick to official app distribution channels. Only download apps from trustworthy sources. Um, make sure that you look at the permissions uh, that every app is asking for when you install it. And if, it, if you're installing a game and it says it wants the ability to read text messages, yeah. that should ring some alarm bells and you should say, maybe I don't want to install that game because there's no reason why it needs to read text messages. So read the permissions that the app is asking for and act appropriately, make the right decision. Um, and also check the publisher. One of the most common ways for criminals to distribute malware right now is to take a popular app, whether it's a game or a utility, um, insert some malicious content and then republish it under another name. So for example, if you want to install Angry Birds, make sure that it's published by Rovio, 
not by Rick Ferguson, because that won't be the real Angry Birds. So check the publisher, check the permissions, and make sure you keep your systems up to date. When it comes to enterprises, the key thing, you have to change your mindset. So an enterprise has to believe that um, breach will happen. Their network will be compromised, and they should design security and systems so that they can be notified of that as early as possible and take action to remedy and contain it. Thanks, Rick. 人类的生活因为行动装置的崛起而越来越方便。不过，其中的安全漏洞却让这些行动装置意味成为骇客新的温床。如何能够确保资讯安全，也成为使用这些新的装置现在最需要考量的问题。<音>